and uh, let's get started. So my name is Ray, I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is that I like to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that Google Cloud has to offer, and also uh, open source projects uh, from Google as well. And um, one of my job is to actually make all of our stuff better, especially for Java developers. And one of the projects I work on personally as well is uh, Spring Cloud GCP. So if you're using Spring, Spring Boot, uh, these are some really nice starters. So you can try some of our services without having to write a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, but if you have any questions, any feedback, please, please contact me on Twitter at Satanism. Aside from technology, I love to travel. I love to uh, take photos everywhere. Uh, you can find some of the photos I took on my Flickr.com uh, site as well. Okay, so uh, this talk, um, I usually go over, so I'm gonna go slightly faster for the intros and then uh, go straight to Eastio as quickly as I can and show you what it can actually do. But I'm not here to talk about the theories of microservices. You should always decide on whether the microservices architect architecture is good for you. Does it actually solve your problem or does it actually create more problems than what you're trying to solve, which could happen. So you gotta be very careful uh, before you choose the architecture style that you want to use for your project. Not, potentially not everything is good with microservice, right? So you just gotta be very careful. But if you do decide to use the microservice architecture, one of the first things that you're going to see is of course, rather than just managing a monolith where you may have a handful of instances you need to run and manage, now you are breaking things down into smaller and smaller components, and now you have to manage all of those instances as well. So rather than managing a dozen of instances, now you're looking at maybe you know, five, 10 different microservices, like two to five instances of each, and now you got like 30, 50 instances you have to manage. How do you do that, right? You have to be able to deploy and manage this deployment. And you're going to run into a lot of issues with just that alone if you don't have the right tooling. How do you deploy that many instances? How do you make sure they're always up and running? How do you make sure that you know, they can deploy to the same machine without a lot of the port conflicts issues? How do you do this automatically? A lot of these things are already solved by using tools or um, other things like a platform as a service. So for example, you could solve many of those issues with Kubernetes and containerization. Just a show of hand, how many people here have heard about Kubernetes already? Okay, very cool, just about everyone. Yeah, nice, woohoo. How many people are using it? Okay, okay, very cool. Almost half of the room, that's awesome. So with Kubernetes, right, we can actually just deploy with the descriptor, right? I wanna go back to this uh, concept uh, very quickly. By writing a declaration on what the desired state is, you just deploy that YAML file or the descriptor into Kubernetes uh, into the master node, and then behind the scenes there's a controller that's going to wake up, right, and just make sure that, hey, how many instances do you actually need for this container image? Oh, you need two? Well, let me go figure out where I, I can actually deploy these two uh, images, right? And then uh, it's gonna do this for all of the instances that you need, start them up, and such and such, right? Very important concept here is that if I were to write this deployment, Right. First of all, I'm just gonna go back to some of the basics here. First of all, I'm going to write the potentially the replicas, how many instances I need. Uh, I can label things in Kubernetes. Again, this is very, very important. We're gonna come back to the labels over and over again. But labels are a way for us to kind of query and ask Kubernetes what's actually running based on certain key value pairs. Uh, these key value pairs can be anything that you want, uh, but then we can later query it like, you know, almost like a where clause to say, tell me everything that's running in my cluster that has this label, right? And then um, we can say which image we wanna run and such and such. Uh, more importantly, we can also define a, a service, which is the, the first class uh, citizen in Kubernetes, which is the, really defines the load balancer. So we can give the name for the service that will then map to the backend instances. So the way that we map a service, a load balancer IP, to the backend instance and which backends are serving uh, this, this load balancer is by basically using labels, by using selectors, right? So we can say, for this particular load balancer, I only want to route traffic to any of the instances in Kubernetes that has the label of guestbook UI with the label of serene equals true true. I'm going to listen on port 80 and uh, target the port, port 80, right? And I can, of course, deploy this very quickly. If I wrote everything in the YAML file, I can deploy everything in one shot, 
assuming I got internet. Yeah, there we go. And if I were to deploy this in one shot, oh, uh, let me see what's going on here. Oh, yeah, I need to open up my visualization tool. Give me one second. Uh -huh. do, 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 do. GCP live visualization 1.2. And here's the, oh, ah, there we go. Proxy, there we go. Oh, is it already used? What the? QO Java? Maybe that's the, that's maybe, that's always the solution, right? Let me see if Java, yeah, there. <laughs> if something's running, uh, now you see the first hand of a um, uh, port conflicts, right? Well, okay, well, since everyone here already seen Kubernetes, so I'm not gonna go into the details, but, you know, all of these things are now deployed in my cluster. I have all of these applications running, and I have my load balancers running, which effectively become my service registry because behind the scenes, these, uh, these services have a list of backends that supports it. And you can, cur you can actually connect to the backends by just using um, the, the DNS name as well or just going to the DNS, uh, going to the IP address directly, okay? So that's all pretty straightforward, right? And everybody knows, uh, approximately everybody here kind of have seen this already. But here's the very important concept we need to take away from the way that Kubernetes work. Uh, number one is that it provides these well-defined types or, or uh, nouns, right? These uh, API objects like deployment, pod, uh, service, and such and such. All of these things are unique to Kubernetes, but it really defines an application architecture and what that architecture should look like at the end of the day. It abstracts you away from the underlying infrastructure, which is really important, right? It doesn't matter where you deploy the service, if you wanted a low balance service that has a public IP address, it doesn't matter which cloud you are actually running in, it will actually interface with the underlying infrastructure, like for example with Google Cloud, we will actually go ahead and create a real Google Cloud load balancer for you. If you use another web services cloud, uh, it will create those load balancers for you as well. But from a developer perspective, right, all of these things are abstracted away by using the common name service, and that's it. We also, it also allows you to manage a cluster of machines or all of the resources in a single view, in an aggregated view. So rather than saying, I need to deploy this onto a machine with 32 cores, you just say, you know, I need a cluster of 1,000 cores and I don't care where this application is deployed to. But the way that this is possible is through the concepts of having what we call the control plan, which is the master itself and the controllers behind the scenes, where you send in the desired state uh, based on the, the YAML files, right? And behind the scenes, the controllers or the master node uh, has a bunch of components that's going to wake up and putting that, those desired state into reality, right? So if you want a real load balance service, you declare that, you send it into the control plan. The control plan will then go to the behind the scenes, maybe into the infrastructure and say, okay, let's go ahead and conjure up a real service here, right? And once the service is created, it creates this data path where you do have a real IP address, you do have the, the, um, the, the low balance backends where you can route to and all that, right? So through the control plan, through the controllers, we create the data plan. Or some people call it the serving path, the data path, but they are really separate. That is why in Kubernetes, if the master node goes down, your serving path is still there, right? It, you just lose control to ch make changes to the serving path, but it's still there, okay? That's very, very important concept before we go into eSteel. The second problem that you're going to experience when you go into microservices architecture is, well, how are they actually going to talk to each other? They are no longer able to talk to each other in memory, Right? In fact, uh, most of the cases, you're gonna be talking to each other over the network. Now you have many, many more issues. Number one is, what language are they going to speak? Right? I think a lot of the, the people are, the developers are uh, defaulting to say REST or JSON over HTTP. But is that the most effective way of using the bandwidth? We're all going to be bounded by the hardware of the underlying infrastructure so we need to use them as efficiently as possible. Is text-based communication between services the right way? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, at Google, we use something called Stubby. 
uh, the open source project of that. It's called gRPC, and that's a binary protocol uh, that's made to be very efficient uh, for the service-to-service -service communication. You should definitely take a look at that as well. But regardless of the language that you speak between your services, uh, they all have to handle a lot more than what you used to handle in a monolith, right? As soon as you go over the network, now you have to deal with bandwidth, the latency, uh, the backend could fail, you need to do the, the retries, you need to be fault tolerant. Uh, how are you going to load balance? Even though Kubernetes provides a first class citizen for load balancing, but that is actually by default a L4 load balancer, which is a network level load balancer, right? But is that the right way to load balance your application and your requests? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how you define load. Uh, for the longest time in, in, the, uh, in my career in the industry for the past 15 years, uh, what I have seen a lot is when people say I need a load balancer, uh, all they're doing is by using round robin load balancing, right? Like, I have never seen anything else but round robin, right? But that's not exactly uh, the, the best case for all of the cases, right? And then we have to think about whether we want client-side load balancing or a proxy load balancer. And there are very um, different use cases for those, right? I think, again, a lot of the developers today are defaulting to client-side load balancer. What that means is you need a service registry, and then you, your client actually needs to know which backends are actually there, and then the client makes the decision on how to load balance and which backend to connect to, right? But that works if you actually have full control over the client, because if you actually need to change the rules of how you are supposed to load balance, now you have to go back and change the client, change the consumer of your service. If you don't have full control over those clients, then it's very hard and very difficult for you to make a change to the way that load balancing is working, right? So if you don't trust the client, if you, trust, if you don't trust the caller, then you have to think about how do I proxy everything and so that I, I have full control on how to load balance uh, each incoming request, right? So gotta be very careful with that. And then of course, with the complicated uh, uh, architecture, you always need a way to look inside. You need to see you know, who's actually calling what. If something broke, you need to know where in the chain of your microservices call actually broke, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot more to just deployment that you have to solve. Again, Kubernetes solves the deployment problem really well, but there is a lot more complexity beyond that, right? And of course, as Java developers, we have a lot of open source tools, the Netflix OSS stack and all that, right? There are definitely open source projects that can help us to solve many of these issues. Like for example, for, a, for service registry, we could use Eureka, Console, or Zookeeper. We can do a client-side load balancing with Ribbon. We can do the retries and fault tolerance with Hystrix and so on and so forth. Or we got Zipkin for distributed tracing, right? The, the list kind of goes on. There's a lot of good tools that we can use. And this is actually really good uh, if you are on a single stack, right? So, but then what happened is that we will be including a lot of these common libraries in each and one of our microservices, right? So your business logic for the microservice is probably this much. And then as soon as you include all of these other client-side libraries to deal with these cross-cutting concerns, right, this library kind of adds up to more and more. Now, this microservice is no longer potentially a microservice anymore. It could be a microservice, right? Because it's actually quite large. It could be 80 megabytes to 100 megabytes if you're using all of these jars in the application itself. And then beyond that, we now have to run all of these auxiliary components outside of the microservice just to support a for architecture, right? We need to run the registry separately. We need to run maybe a gateway separately. We need all of these other tools surrounding this entire architecture. There's nothing wrong with that, just, but then just remember, for every one of these gray boxes on the screen, you gotta manage them as well, right? So now, but if you just run one single service, you're looking at all of these other things you have to manage, and you also have to run them in a highly available fashion with backup and all of the other good stuff. Right, so it becomes a little bit more complicated, but it gets even more complicated if you're using different stack. Now, I love Spring Boot, and Spring Boot can give you a lot of these tools out of the box, which is great. But it gets really complicated if you're not just using a single stack, right? If you're using multiple different frameworks, or maybe you're using different languages for that matter. Maybe you're using Java and Go and Node, uh, and they all need to work together. What happens then? 
Well, to a lot of people, they actually go back to this list and say, okay, what are the cross cutting concerns I need to deal with? And then we go back and find the corresponding components for those languages as well, and they all have to interop together, and that's where complexity really, really comes in, uh, even more so if you have a legacy application as well, okay? But at the end of the day, we really just want two services to communicate with each other, and hopefully, uh, simple enough, so that it's just as easy as making an HTTP request or a, a gRPC call, for that matter, okay? So let's just write some code, and, um, and hopefully, uh, see what, um, you know, what simple applications we can write, and then how we can apply all of these cross-cutting concerns, how we can solve all, all of these concerns by not actually having those libraries in our application. Okay. So we're going to write a very simple you know, server and client thing. So we'll have, I'll have two services. Uh, one of the services is going to be called work. Okay. So this is like the service you call when you want me to do some work. Uh, what is work? Well, work could potentially just be uh, a sequence of meaningless meetings, okay? So that's why I have another service called meeting, just so, you know, to do work, I'm going to go to some meetings, just like uh, most people do, right? So I'm going to write the meeting server first, and when I'm thinking through it, um, there are many ways for me to write this, right? It doesn't matter which language I write it in, but I don't know JavaScript, uh, I don't know Go well, um, and I love Java, um, and I want to use the simplest components I can get in Java, and also things that you should probably never use at this moment. Uh, first of all, I'm using Java 9, the same. Uh, that's already end of life. And secondly, I'm going to be using uh, HTTP server, the Sun HTTP server. Anyone use that for their production app before? No? Good. <laughs> you probably shouldn't either. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the simplest thing that I can find in Java and write this very simple microservice. So I'm going to just say, um, I'm going to listen on port 8081, and then uh, maybe, uh, uh, there we go. And then I'm going to assign this to a little variable here called server. Uh, ultimately, I need to start the server, and this is blocking. That's fine. And then we need to set executors so we can actually listen to multiple uh, concurrent requests. And then finally, we can say, um, create a context, and I'm going to listen to meet endpoint. Uh, which is when I'm working, somebody want a meeting, they will come to they will come to this endpoint, right? And this will give me something called the exchange, okay? And in this exchange, uh, I can actually get my headers and stuff like that. So so this is where I can do work. So how do I actually what do I actually do in the meeting? Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, this is what I do usually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that you do this. It's just me. This is just me. All right. So, <laughs> so, so if I do successfully have done that, then I'm going to send the header back 200, right? Uh, zero response, because I slept the whole way, so I have nothing to input here for the meeting. I'm going to close the connection, and that's it. That's a very, very simple service, probably the simplest I can write. Oh, there we go, that's because my, some of my service is running. Yeah, so if I come back here to start the visualizer, uh, that would just work, but anyways. So, that's my meeting service. Uh, how many people think this will actually just work? Wow, nobody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There are two people in the entire room who think this might just work. Uh, and I hope I don't lose your faith. So uh, there we go. I, I think this is working. It's, at least it didn't quit on the spot, right? So that's good. Um, so let me see here. Oh, there's my proxy. Uh, yep. So let me do a curl, uh, local host. And I think I'm listening on 8081, right? Oh, and slash meet. And I think that worked. Uh, if I time it, it should have taken more than 250 milliseconds, right? So that's pretty consistent. Took a total of 300 milliseconds to do this, which is not bad. Okay, so I got my consuming. I, I got my backend, a very simple one. And now I can write my um, the, the caller, which will be another microservice here that's going to listen to the work uh, URL. Uh, I'm going to do something very uh, quickly here because of the time. Usually, it takes me too much time to write this rest of the code. But basically, uh, I don't know how many meetings you go. I go to four meetings a day that will code out work, and then I slack off the, the rest of the day, right? So I'm going to slack off even more by doing something that somebody, when they saw it the first time, they called this backwards programming, okay? And why is it backwards? Because um, I am actually typing backwards. <laughs> All right, so now I go to four meetings, right? Not bad. 
Just because of the time, I don't, yeah, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time just writing this boilerplate code, but this is using the Java 9 H3 client, which is an incubator. Again, something you should probably not use at this very moment either. But here's the thing. I'm going to go to the meeting by making the call, right? Here's the, the, the request, and I'm going to uh, get the response back. And then uh, if the response is 200, that means I successfully went to a meeting and slept, I'm going to count it as a point here. So I'm, I, I can finally say how many meetings I went uh, that I successfully didn't contribute much, okay? And then <laughs> one thing in Istio uh, that we need to do for sure, when you make these microservice to microservices calls, right, even though this is just an HTTP call, we still need to somehow correlate the calls together. So if I called you and you call somebody else on my behalf, we need to be able to correlate all of these calls together into a single request, or in this case, we're going to say a single trace. And Istio, or the service mesh, usually will produce a trace ID for you if nothing existed. Uh, your application is still responsible to pass the trace ID along to the next call, and the next call is responsible to pass that trace ID alone to the next call as well. So now every single call would have a trace ID associated with it, and then finally you can type back everything into the same trace ID. This is how typically the distributed tracing works. So in this little code here, which I also wrote really, really quickly, <laughs> um, basically I'm, there are some headers that we do need to pass in terms of Istio. So uh, usually there's the XP3 headers. So if you're using Spring Boot, if you're using Spring Cloud Sleuth 2, or for that matter, uh, they're really propagating traces by using the XP3 header. So what that means is you can actually deploy your existing Spring Boot application if you're using Spring Cloud Sleuth. Uh, you can actually propagate headers automatically out of the box already, which will actually work wonderfully in a service mesh context. But there's a few more headers that we may or may not need to pass, depends on what you need to do, but I'm gonna pass everything, which is X request ID, and also the, the OT span context. Uh, the last one is definitely optional. Okay, so basically I wrote this little code very quickly <coughs> to uh, code the meeting service four times, pass the headers alone, and let you see if this one also works. Okay, so let me see. Uh, here we go. So if I do a curl and localhost 8080, right, and then slash work, and if it works, it should have code the backend four times, and everything is running just fine. If I run this again, just to warm it up a little bit, we can see we code four meetings, which I slept for 250 milliseconds in total, so that's one second in total that I have spent just to do work, okay? Everything works so far. Now, what happens if my meeting server went away. So if I went here and stopped my meeting server, now my backend went away. In this piece of code, I have no retries, I have no circuit breakers, uh, there's nothing I am doing to protect it from failure. So what do you think would happen if I make this call again? Anyone? No? No, it will, it will fail, it will fail somehow. Uh, but because I didn't catch all the exceptions, <laughs> So basically, I'm getting this empty reply from server, and now all things breaks down. This is what's going to happen to your services too if you are not be care if you're not careful to uh, deal with errors, and you're always supposed to be doing that, right? So, but I didn't get to do that here. All I'm doing here is checking the response header, uh, making sure that's uh, 200, right? So that's probably not the best practice, but we're going to see how this ties into Istio, right? Um, and then. What I can do, of course, is to, I'm going to do a clean package. Just so you know, this is real. <laughs> There's nothing, everything here is live, right? So while I'm doing the package, I'm using a Spotify Maven uh, Docker plugin, and this, this is actually going to create the Docker container for me uh, right now, and then pushing it to the registry, and now I have this in my Docker hub as well. I'm going to do the same thing for my work server too. Right, and ultimately we're gonna be deploying this into a server environment. But before I do that, I'm just gonna show you uh, how big this microservice is. Any guesses? 80, 20 megabytes, 80, uh, one megabyte. Well, let me just show you, because this is all using out-of-the-box JDK, so this microservice, it doesn't do a lot. It's only about 3.4K, 
right? Because there's no dependencies here. It's just straight out. And you can think about this as if you are to write Node or anything else, or Go, where you don't really have a lot of the other uh, components, these are what, this is how it's going to behave as well, okay? So I created the two services, and then I can just deploy this into a mesh. But what is a mesh? What is a service mesh? It's a, it's a new term, again, right? But, um, but I'm going to demystify it a little bit, tell you how it actually works behind the scenes so it's not it's so much of a mystery, and we can actually see why this works in terms of helping you uh, managing your microservices and deal with the communication. And this is what Istio comes in. Istio is the open source project, project that was open sourced by Google, IBM, and Lyft together. Okay? And it was designed from ground up to solve the problems that Kubernetes itself doesn't solve. Remember, Kubernetes is a control plan that solves the deployment and management issues of your application. Istio essentially is the control plan that helps you to solve the service to service communication issues with low balancing and uh, uh, circuit breakers and all that, okay? And the way that you would think about Istio is, again, going back to, to the control plane concept. In Kubernetes, we deploy a YAML that declares what my application should look like when it's running, when it's serving. In Istio, it's very similar. These routing rules, the service-to-service -service communication rules, the circuit-breaking rules, the retry rules, uh, all of these rules can now be defined in a declaration, in a configuration that you can then deploy into the Istio control plane. Once the Istio control plane receives this configuration centrally, it can then propagate this com configuration onto the serving path, okay? And that's exactly how Istio works, and that's what a service mesh is. So behind the scenes, what we can actually do is to potentially get rid of some of these client-side components that we have, you know, we typically have. Like what I've just done, I have this 3K application with nothing. Uh, we may not even need a lot of these other components either because Kubernetes provides the service registry. Kubernetes uh, can potentially provide you with an ingress that can help you front your microservices, so you don't need a separate component to run that, right? Kubernetes can help you with configuration, so you don't need a centralized configuration server either. Uh, you might need other things, but, uh, but you can really cut down on what your application really need, and you can cut down on the peripherals as well. And then all of these client-side components that we just took away, like I didn't add any of them, well, where do they actually go? The code uh, have to go somewhere, right? You, you need logic to execute, and if you take away code and don't introduce it back, right, you don't get that piece of logic. So we literally just shift and move the common code that you may have in every one of your microservices. We shift it out, and we move it into a proxy, okay? And this proxy is, by default, an Envoy proxy that's used today by Lyft, the, the car-sharing company in, in the U.S., and they have battle tested it in their production environment. And the proxy itself can do a lot of things. It can do uh, service discovery with, against Kubernetes endpoints. It can do load balancers. Uh, it, it, ha it can do circuit breaking and all that stuff, right? So the proxy can do all of the things that we typically have to do in our client side. Now, some of you, uh, how many people here have gone through the SOA architecture days? Yeah, yeah, like half the room, and they're like, ooh, that sounds really scary. <laughs> Why? Because, hmm, because in SOA days, uh, there's the concept of ESB, Enterprise Service Bus, which used to front all of your services behind the scenes that also promised all of these good features, right? And, but that failed. That, that didn't really get anywhere. Uh, but potentially, the, the reason why it failed is because, well, it may not have been applied in the right places, but more importantly, the deployment of ESBs were uh, flawed at the time because uh, usually what you end up with is this one single server or a few servers that has all of the rules for all of the services and all of the requests have to come through this single bottleneck and very quickly becomes the bottleneck of the entire system. It wasn't distributed. The way that Istio, the service mesh, work is by taking this proxy, which is really small, by the way. It doesn't make a lot of sense to take away 80 megabytes of jar and introduce a two gigabyte proxy, right? That, that's, <laughs> that doesn't work. 
But so the proxy itself is really tiny. It's written in C++. What happens that we do in Istio is that we will introduce a proxy instance for every one of your microservice instance. Okay? So rather than running just a single proxy or a single set of you know, central load balancers that we are managing, this is actually distributed across your entire cluster, running alongside of every instance of your microservice. And this is done by using Kubernetes sidecar pattern. So every time we deploy my application, it's going to add a proxy into this whole mix next to your uh, container that's running inside the pod. As you scale out the number of instances of your microservice, it will also scale out the number of proxies as well. And behind the scenes, there's also an initialization container, init container, that will actually set up some kind of IP table rules. What that's going to do is to actually capture all of the incoming and outgoing requests and forwarding that to the proxy that's running next to your service. So now it's going to transparently intercept every connection. And if we understand what the connection is, if it's HTTP, it effectively intercepts every request as well. That is the fabric of the service mesh. There's nothing else to it. This is the most simple way of looking at what the service mesh is. Okay? And now, because we're intercepting everything, when your microservice is going to make a call to, say, microservice B, or in this case, to my, to my meeting service, that connection will be intercepted by the proxy. The proxy connects with Kubernetes, which looks up all the endpoints. And the proxy itself performs the load balancing based on the rule that you have uh, that you have put in, okay? And then it's going to connect to the target service by picking one of the backend instance to connect to. On the way in, the incoming call is also intercepted by the proxy as well. And then the proxy can do a lot of interesting things now. It can check whether you have authorization to make that call. It can also check whether the service calling me has the authorization to make a call to me. If the proxy determines that everything is good, then it can forward the request to the actual destination, right? And if not, then we can just reject the request, right? It's very, very simple. Somebody, uh, Matt Rabel, when he saw it, he actually called this the aspect AOP, aspect-oriented programming for microservices, right? Because we use AOP extensively within Java to deal with cross-cutting concerns. This surface mesh is really just AOP for any microservices to deal with the cross-cutting concerns. So we're just extracting the logic one level up, okay? And now we can also ask many, many different questions. For example, who is actually calling what? Right, who's making the calls? Well, you, you can't really document it because these things change all the time. So what you can say is, well, the proxy knows, right? The proxy intercepts everything by default. So if you made a call to another service, the proxy understands that. So proxy can actually forward all of these trace information to a tracer, to, to Zipkin, for example. You might be interested in, well, which part of my microservice architecture is actually running slow, right? Which, is, which service is responding slowly? Well, you can actually ask the proxy. The proxy knows, because if the proxy knows you make a call to another microservice, it knows when the call started. It also knows the, when the response came back, and now you have the latency, and we can just record that into Prometheus. And there's more things that you can do, but most importantly, in my mind, is actually that you can actually establish a mutual TLS connection between these proxies uh, within the microservice itself. It can actually be automatically configured. What that means is that as a Java developer, I absolutely hate to deal with SSL certificates and the key stores in Java, right? And I try to do that yourself with mutual TLS, and then try to rotate the, the certificates frequently. Rather than writing all of those logic, they can all be extracted and now into this service mesh proxy. So in Istio, there's an option to deploy in a secure manner where all of the calls are actually performed over mutual TLS. Okay? And without having to write or change any part of the code than what I've just done in this simple application. Okay? If I deploy this into the right Istio um, environment, uh, this call right here that makes the call to HTTP client, that will be encrypted over the network um, beyond the proxy, okay? And then all of this data that we collect, right, the latency, the, the, the traces and all that, 
they can be abstracted away to the underlying platform services. So just like Kubernetes, where we abstract away the underlying infrastructure, Istio abstracts away the underlying platform services that you may need to fully operate your, your application. So for example, the monitoring tool like Grafana and Prometheus and Zipkin, well, if you don't want to manage those, if you're running the cloud platforms, then maybe you can take them out and then just use some managed services instead because it's a plug pluggable uh, architecture. So like the, this data from Prometheus and Zipkin, they can just be forwarded to the underlying cloud managed services. So you don't have to worry about space or uh, keeping them up and running, so you can offload that if you want to. Uh, but the way that you deploy your application and the way that you define your rules are exactly the same regardless of the underlying infrastructure that you have, okay? So with that all being said, let me just go back here and do, uh, to do the actual deployment. So what I have done here is I pushed my code into Docker registry, right, Docker Hub, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and just deploy these applications. And for that, I have this latest set of files, which I can see here we have a work deployment, for example. If I scroll down here, I can see that I'm going to deploy a work server with two replicas using, um, there we go, using the image here, which I just created. Um, and then I have my work service as well. Here's the SVC. And then we have the selector that goes to the work server, right, backend. So all of these are just defined in my um, YAML file. So I'm going to deploy everything here, and hopefully everything works, I'm crossing my fingers. Because <laughs> obviously some, something failed earlier, right? Okay, so there we go. Let me see if I can go back to the browser and do a refresh. No, still not. Oh, yeah, it's because my, these applications are still running. Let me stop everything. Yeah, there we go. Woohoo. All right, so I, ha I can see all my applications here. Uh, hopefully, I can also see the work server, which I have two instances of, and the meeting server, which I have two instances of, right? There are very, very basic things, uh, almost no code to it, all right? Uh, the way I front end it is by using an ingress. Now, this ingress is very special, so this is maybe some of you may be relating it to uh, an API gateway, right? So I can map the specific URLs to a specific backend. Okay? And this ingress is also fronted by Istio proxies as well. So any rules I apply to Istio uh, will actually get uh, applied as well. Now here's the magic. If I actually open up a new command line here, and if I say kubectl get ingress, I should be able to see my public IP address. There we go, I have my work ingress. And then if I do a curl uh, slash work, uh, hopefully that works. It's going to code the backend four times, and it did, right? As I just coded this just now, right? And it's doing this call right now. So what I'm going to do is to put this into a loop. I'm going to say uh, a while true, is that right? Do, and <laughs> I'm going to uh, write this there and done. This is the best way to write a for loop, okay? So I'm making all of these calls to, to my microservice work, and that's behind the scenes, that's making the calls to meeting. Without any additional work, I get a couple of things in Istio right off the bat. Okay. First of all, uh, if I want to see uh, latency metrics, right? if I want to monitor these things with like, how long did all the calls take, I can open up the Grafana dashboard. Because remember, the proxy remem uh, is forwarding all of this data. It's all being collected by Prometheus. right? So I can go here, I can go to port 3000. And here we can, so this is using a kubectl proxy, which goes to, you know, goes into my cluster, finds the right pod, and now I'm actually looking at the Grafana instance in my Istio uh, environment, and I can see how many QPS I'm currently making. I can see the success rate, which is 100% successful, and so on and so forth. I can even drill this down to say, okay, do I know which service I wanna look at? Well, the source should be a work service, and I want to see which service this actually calls. So I'm going to say, uh, I only want the metrics against work service to the meeting service, right? So I can make this change, and I can see that specific uh, metrics, right? Again, this is just right off the bat on um, the service mesh, what we can actually provide you. You can actually go into the Prometheus dashboard directly to make your own Prometheus query if you need to, okay? And, but what's even more interesting, of course, is we have uh, Zipkin as well. So again, just by tr 
passing along those trace headers uh, because all of the things are being intercepted by the proxy, right? We will forward, the based on the trace headers, we can actually record all of these traces against Zipkin right off the bat. You don't actually need to use Zipkin locally if you don't want to, okay? So here I can see, for example, let me go down to my work server. I can find all the traces, and here's the trace from my call, which took about one second, and here I can actually see uh, the route uh, that, that you took, and then you actually made the call to the meeting server four times, and how long you actually made the call for. All of these things, again, are right off the bat of the things that's provided to you by Istio, okay? Pluggable, also. You can switch it out for other things if you like to. But what is the most interesting thing here is the control plane. So far, I haven't done anything yet, but the way I deploy this application, right? If I open up this deployment, uh, is this the one? Uh, no, let me just go back here. Let me go to the JDK example, go to Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Latest. All right, so the way I have done this deployment, if you look at this deployment very closely again, you can see that we have the replicas, and I got one image inside, and that's it, in our file. Where did the proxy come from? Is this is actually running in the Istio environment? So there are two ways for us to actually make sure that our applications have the proxy running alongside of the instances. If I see a git pod right now, what you're going to see is that every one of these server actually have two instances, two containers inside, okay? That is because uh, in my setup, I have what we call the automatic sidecar injection. What that means is as soon as I deploy my application, it actually calls a Kubernetes webhook behind the scenes. It's called a mutating admission webhook. What that does is to say, can I actually accept this workload? And if I can, let me modify the state of it. So behind the scenes, it actually injected the proxy container for me and also the init proxy for me as well. If you don't like this automatic injection thing because you, know, you don't know what you actually have done, then what you can do is by using what we call the, the, the manual injection, by using the Istio command line, Istio uh, CTO, we can do something like kube inject, do that, and then um, I can just give it the file, like work deployment, like that, and then if I show you what it actually outputs, it's going to filter through the deployment file, which is a regular Kubernetes deployment, but if I scroll down, not only do I see the application container itself, but if I scroll down even more, I can see the actual proxy being injected into this deployment file as well. And then if I scroll down even more, uh, I can see the init container uh, that's actually being added too, right? So this init container is the one that sets up the IP table rules that forwards everything into the proxy sidecar, right? You can do this manually or you can do this uh, automatically, right? And that is how all the connections, that, oh, that's how all the connections and the serving path is being created. Now here's the interesting thing. If I go back to, oh, sorry, I'm just, I lost off here. Yeah, there we go, I'm still making those calls, right? If I go back to my demo here. Now, with this application, because it's already weaved inside of the, the Istio environment, right, the serving path is already intercepted by the proxy, all I need to do is to send any any kind of control that I want to Istio the control plan, which is called Istio pilot, is going to take this configuration and then propagate down to every instance of your application, okay? So for example, let me just deploy another version of my app, okay? So I'm going to deploy Kubernetes v2, so this is the uh, second version of my work. Uh, this is why I work really, really hard. Rather than going to four meetings, I'll go to hopefully uh, eight meetings, there we go. I work really, really hard. I go to eight meetings, right? And now by default, uh-oh, <laughs> uh, there we go. It's just syncing up the connections. Now by default, oh, what's going on here? Oh, you know what? Let me just delete all the rules. Delete uh, raw, delete F. Let me delete all the rules here. By default, it's going to try to do a wrong robin here. It's, so it's going to do uh, working really hard and then uh, working just regularly, okay? So there we go. Uh oh, <laughs> let me see if this is just uh, temporary. Give me one second. Work hard and not working so hard, and then arrow. <laughs> let me see, get SVC, no. Well, I'm gonna keep it like that for now because I don't actually know what's happening. 
However, this is what we can do. If I have multiple versions of this, uh oh, it's going in and out. If I have multiple versions of this, I can use a rule to default older versions to older codes to just one version. So if I don't know like, which version is actually having issues, like what I have right now, well, let me go ahead and default everything to version uh, latest, which is the one I just wrote. Okay, so let me see if this is fi fixes it. So I'm going to say route to the latest version, right? This configuration is sent up to the Istio pilot, the control plan. Okay, this is good. It's actually working, right? Whew, that was, that's, that was close, right? So w there are too many versions running here. I don't know which one's having issues. So why don't I just route everything to a single version? That's exactly what I have done, right? So through the Istio pilot, the control plan, it propagated this routing rule down to all the proxies. And now all of the codes are going to the latest version. Not too bad, right? I can, of course, if I want to, do a canary deployment in this case. So for example, if you have two versions of your app, if you wanna route certain percentage of the request to a newer version, because you, know, you don't wanna do what I just done, which is, you know, I don't know if the, the new version works or not, right? What you can do is to specify a routing rule in Istio that says only route 80% of the traffic to latest and only route 20% of the traffic to the newer version, and that's it, right? And the way that we decide which version of the app to route to is by using the labels, of course, right? So let me try that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and apply my route v2 and 20p. Okay, so now what it's going to hopefully do is to route 20% of the traffic to the newer version and only 80% of the traffic to the, old, to the old version, right? And obviously I do have some issues here with the newer version, so maybe I can detect it and I can roll back. Right, so how do I roll back? Well, let me just apply the rule that will route everything to latest, right? Something is wrong with the new version, let me just roll back to the previous uh, deployments uh, of my configuration, and let's just go back to the previous version. We can do much, much more. Uh, for example, if you like to be that person that's fun on the team, where you like to play uh, Chaos Monkey games, you can actually add a rule that can simulate fault, right? So in this case, I can actually simulate fault based on, again, percentage of the traffic. I can say, in this case, right, it will be 50%, 100% of the request to meeting, I want to return 503, right? So all I need to do is to apply this rule. Again, gets propagated down to all the proxy configuration. And very, very quickly, you can see I'm unable, unable to go to any meetings anymore because all of them are returning 503s. And somebody on your team will be like, haha, you did it again, uh, right? Then what do you do? You can just say, all right, that was me. So let me go ahead and delete this rule and get rid of it. And all of a sudden, everything will eventually catch up, right? All the proxy gets configured and you're back into um, your application running just fine, right? And there's a lot more to it, of course. So one of the last thing I wanna talk about is actually circuit breaking. Typically, uh, we can, when we think about circuit breaking, what do we do? We think about detecting outliers. What that means is if out of the, all of my backend, if one of them is bad, we need to mark it as bad and retry that bad backend maybe 20 seconds later. And if it continuously to be bad, then we need to take it out of our list completely. That is if you're running a separate registry and all that, right? Of course, Istio can do exactly the same thing and in it is called circuit breaking with outlier detection. But there's another circuit breaker that we have to keep in mind, which is, for example, the circuit breaker in this building, right? So for example, if a light bulb goes out in this building, what does the circuit breaker actually do? Does it actually say, oh, the light bulb is out, let's cut power to that particular socket and let's retry the power later? It doesn't actually do that, right? The circuit breaker in your house or in this building is here to, to, to protect being uh, overloaded or having the, the power drawn too much or being having too much power uh, delivered to the building, right? And the, the circuit breaker will break. In Istio, that type of cir circuit breaking also exists. And by doing this, what you can do is to basically protect your services from DDoSing. You should always know how many uh, connections you can actually handle and then you can add these rules into your Istio environment, and this will configure the proxies, and now your services are protected 
potentially from being overloaded, and this is a very good situation to avoid uh, because then if you are always being overloaded, your service may actually not start, okay? And finally, just remember, all the things I just showed you, if I deployed it into the right environment with Istio off, it actually has a certificate authority that's going to rotate out the certificate for the proxy automatically and then establish this mutual TLS on a trustless network, then you don't have to really worry about uh, running your application in the different environments, okay? So with all that being said, just remember, it still allows you to get some visibility into your application. It's a single point of control or control plane to allow you to add resiliency and routing rules to your application without having to have so much uh, backend, uh, sorry, client-side um, logic in your application. And finally, if you need to learn more, uh, just go and join the eSteel.io and the, the user group as well. And also, you can find all the demos and all the code and even a lab on my site at satanism.me slash talk, okay? And I know my time is up, so thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh.